Hello and welcome everybody to our keynote interview with one of the capital market's best known figures and dare I say it, most important figures of the last 20 years, uh, Sir Robert Stamen, Chief Executive Officer of the UK Debt Management Office, the agency of the Treasury responsible for issuing gilts and managing the gilts market. When I say most important figures of the last 20 years, while well, that's true, his position has arguably never been more important than over the last 16 months, the period during which the UK has massively ramped up its borrowing requirement in order to combat the terrible effects uh, that the coronavirus has wrought on people's health and the economy. Uh, the DMO raised an incredible 485.5 billion in the last financial year. Just to put that number into context, in 2018-19, it did 98.6. Uh, some interesting Sir Robert facts for you. Robert was born and educated in the UK, and before joining the DMO in 2003, held positions at Vreins Investbank in Hamburg and Deutsche Bank in Frankfurt, where he transacted Deutschmark denominated bonds. Another fun fact, Robert has shown us that failing your O-level maths twice is no obstacle to running the UK debt management office for 18 years and to being knighted, which he was in 2016. Well, th thank you for that, Toby, and, 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 and good afternoon, everyone. I, I just say on, on that sort of penultimate point, um, maybe that explains why we thought we were starting out with a borrowing requirement of 156 billion and ended up with uh, 485 billion. I clearly can't count. Um, so, Robert, let's get started with the here and now, if that's all right. Um, the UK is preparing to launch its first ever Green Guild, something that is now expected in September this year. Um, I'd like to know, if that's all right, what has been the experience of creating a Green Bond programme, um, Sir Robert? And, uh, you know, it could be said that the UK is a little late to the sovereign Green Bond party. Um, I mean, I'd like to think that in the UK, we have always been open and we've always said that we are open to the introduction of new financing instruments, including green bonds. Um, we have, as you and I'm sure many other people are aware, been very focused on things such as value for money. Does it make good sense for the taxpayer? Uh, and that's something we have to be focused on. But, you know, whenever we've innovated, we have often tended not to be first mover. And in general, I would say that perhaps has not always been a bad thing because very often, especially in the market such as green, being first mover came at quite a considerable cost. Um, what is interesting now, and as of course everyone is aware, that the initial costs that were associated with green bond issuance a couple of years ago, they seem to have moderated quite significantly, and that makes it much, much more attractive. Um, the other point from our perspective is we also want to see how these markets develop, because for us, really critical is that we want to know that there is going to be strong and sustained demand for the product. So to the UK's plans, you are aware that the Chancellor of the Exchequer said that he wanted to see us not just issue a green bond, but also to build a green bond curve. And that is important also in the context of is this going to be a sustainable market, one where we can actually issue potentially at multiple points across the curve. And we feel pretty confident about that at the moment. So the experience, there is an enormous amount of work. I'm sure anyone who has been involved in doing this in terms of the structuring and colleagues at the DMO and at the Treasury, and in some cases also other government departments as well, have all been involved in this and are still involved in probably more conference calls over the last 12 months than I care to mention. Um, and uh, as I say, it is a lot of work. Um, we're getting there. And the good news is that um, we have recently announced that we expect market conditions permitting to be able to issue the first transaction in September. And just uh, on the subject, uh, it will be a green uh, bond as opposed to a sustainability linked bond, for example. 
That's correct. Um, it will be green and it will also be what's known, I think, as the use of pro use the use of proceeds model. That's the one that uh, that, that has been chosen. Um, that's considered now in many respects pretty standard. What I would just say, I think is quite interesting, just as a thought, because um, we need to see how the market develops, not just in the next weeks and months, but over the next years is whether there is a gradual move towards perhaps more of the sustainable model, more of the wider ESG agenda, which I think is a very interesting, potentially very interesting thing. Um, we don't know yet, we'll just have to see. Okay, now of course, green and ESG are a very, very hot topic, um, but so too is inflation and whether its return is cyclical or structural, uh, we can't quite tell yet. Uh, but um, how can you react to strong investor interest in inflation products? You, you recently did a very popular linker at the end of May, the four billion deal that was, I think I'm right in saying, the largest ever of its kind in cash terms. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, well, you've also partially provided the answer. The way one, if you like, reacts to that um, investor interest is by trying to take advantage of that by issuing into that strong demand and then obviously achieving, we hope again, a good price for the taxpayer. Uh, that is, is, sounds a little bit prosaic. Um, the, the point which I would make at the moment about the inflation market, especially in the UK, uniquely in the UK, is that I'm sure you and others are aware, we've had a little bit of a hiatus um, over the last year or so, due to the uh, consultation on the future of the RPI. Yeah. Um, so that had a significantly damping effect on our issuance volumes last year. And there is probably a lot of pent up demand, which is supporting the market at the moment very strongly. Uh, we're trying to issue into that, so we're issuing considerably more this year, um, considerably more. Um, in percentage terms, obviously, uh, but also in particular in, in uh, you know, actually in, in, in nominal terms. I would just say that it's a, it's a very interesting market. Um, uh, it's one where the UK has been present now for 40 years, actually, exactly 40 years. Um, 1981 was the, uh, was the first link issuance. And it's a market that is central to our core domestic investor base. And we're very conscious of that. And we intend to supply alongside, of course, the nominal curve, we intend to supply into that market where we can. I suppose where my question was really going was, if there is just such huge demand for inflation linked product, can you alter your funding program to accommodate that? Are you switch out of, for example, conventional and into inflation linked? Or is that not quite the DMO style? Um, well, on a sort of broader, from a broader perspective, we've done exactly that, okay. um, arguably this year compared to the previous year. You know, there's a significant, as I say, significant change in, um, uh, in, in the amount of linkers that we're doing actually this year. Um, within the year, we've been given a remit and that remit has sort of approximately what has, has fixed percentages, fixed actual um, absolute amounts as well within the total number that we, the figure that we have to raise. And we do need to stick to that as much as we possibly can. Uh, we don't generally like to change the composition of the instruments or the maturity buckets mm. during the year for the simple reason that the market does not appreciate surprises. They know when the key fiscal events occur and they know when to expect announcements, also issuance announcements from the DMO. And we would rather be seen as being these, these famous twin virtues of debt managers, predictable and transparent, which makes us very boring. <laughs> uh, at least you're consistent, Robert. Uh, um, now, um, in terms of borrowing activities, uh, uh, which will be bumpier, uh, the takeoff, i.e. the sudden increase in requirement last year that we mentioned at the beginning, or the landing, i.e. adapting to potential tapering 
inflationary forces, for example? That's, that is actually a very good question. I'll just say that the actual takeoff last year, um, and it's actually even just over a year ago now, especially in, in March, April last year, April in particular. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I've never been in an aircraft which has taken off in quite the same way. Um, uh, and like everyone else, one hopes for a smooth landing. I mean, I would say that we faced an unprecedented time last year. And I know everyone uses that word and it's a bit overused, but it's worth recalling that in March at the time of the budget last year, we were still expecting and announcing that we would have a remit of 156 billion. Um, just a few weeks later, that was torn up. And as the year developed, as you just said, you know, we, we've issued just shy of 500 billion. And that was obviously a huge change. The point about that was not that it was, it was actually almost, I'd say, more difficult in this, in, from two perspectives at the time. One was to make sure that we could design an issuance program that allowed us to hold all the necessary operations to raise those very large amounts. For the, for the UK, that meant doing things that we hadn't done before, such as holding more than one auction on a single day. Um, and of course, increasing sizes, in some cases, syndicating in parts of the curve where we hadn't syndicated previously. That actually, we managed to achieve that, and we sort of moved into what I would describe as a steady state of issuance already by May, June, June. And since then, if anything, the pace has actually declined. Now, to your point, the landing, you know, what happens, um, uh, I, the landing is perhaps more significant, not so much just for the amounts that we're issuing, but for the wider market. What happens to the market from here? Because obviously yields um, declined very significantly um, just over a year ago. Uh, and I think behind your question is, well, what happens when the market might not be quite so conducive to issuance or has to readjust? And I use that word advisedly. The market will have to readjust as necessary to whatever the wider central banking environment actually requires um, you know, in terms of the implementation of monetary policy. Um, that could mean that we will see further rises in yields. Um, I just find it very interesting, as an, just as an observation, that at the beginning of the year, as everyone knows, we saw quite a dramatic rise in yields globally, uh, led by the US, uh, but also here and in other major fixed income markets. Um, and then, since then, yields have been remarkably stable. And in spite of many predictions for ever higher yields, I mean, even now, as you know, we've seen yields occasionally inch lower and below the highs of March, March, April, which I find very interesting. That's not to say that I know exactly what's going to happen. I do not. What we need and we have always needed and every debt manager needs is we need the price adjustment process, the price adjustment mechanism in the market to work smoothly to allow the market to take down our supply in an orderly fashion. I always repeat that because it's so important. What that also means is we need a well-functioning, deeply liquid, uh, attractive market to all investors. So a very much related question, I think, but how, how should one expect rising rates uh, and or a steepening curve to impact the tenors a sovereign debt manager chooses to issue at? Um, so when we decide on which tenors to issue at the beginning of a financial year, we always have to, as all sovereign debt management managers do, we have to balance cost and risk. Those are the two big factors that we sort of, you know, have to play off against each other. Now, if you have a so-called normal shaped yield curve, that means issuing in the short end saves you money, issuing in the long end might minimize a certain type of refinancing risk. And it's always a question of 
balance. Um, and uh, I would just say that if yields actually, I mean, we've set up, we've set up what we're going to be issuing um, in the current financial year already, and we want to stick to that. I think it would be wrong, for instance, were, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, but were yields to rise, for instance, more at the long end than uh, at the shorter end. For us then to switch away from the long end, I think would be the wrong choice because it goes back to my earlier comment about not trying to spring surprises on the market. So I think once we've decided on a strategy, we need to stick to it for the pre-announced period for that year. You know, we'll see what next year's strategy looks like. Okay, thank you. And um, how, how has your investor base evolved since March last year? And I guess the non-bank uh, part of that investor base. I think so, the non-central bank part of that, I mean. Sorry, know. yes. I mean, the, the, bank, the Bank of England part, oh, well, yes, yeah. Indeed, um, it's it's actually very interesting, um, uh, and this is something which I think perhaps has gone slightly below the radar. Um, although a few people commented on this recently, that um, what we refer to as um, uh, the Bank of England's own published data on uh, flows into gilts. I mean, flows into gilts last year were a record, and I should say, excuse me, flows into gilts from international investors, overseas investors, were to record, um, certainly in absolute numbers. Um, and that might sound slightly counterintuitive, uh, yet I think what it does do is it highlights the fact that what QE did in the UK, but also elsewhere, certainly in the US, was it act, it has acted as a stabilizing force in financial markets and in government bond markets in particular. That gave investors throughout all of last year confidence that this was not a market that they should abandon. This was a market in which they could be involved in, and this applies to gilts as well. So actually, the percentage holdings of gilts by international investors has effectively barely changed over the last 12 months. In other words, the market has, has, has increased. Clearly, central bank holdings have increased. It has declined slightly, but only slightly. And that gives me a lot of reassurance in terms of the composition of our investor base remaining diverse, not being dominated by central bank QE. And I think that is critical to maintaining a healthy market in the future. And do you get any visibly, visibility on the type of investor, i.e., um, you know, non non official institutions, so hedge funds and the like, are they are they maintaining that level of interest, or are they declining slightly? That's interesting. Um, yes, we do get some um, from partly from what we observe through our own operations. Yeah. I mean, the, the official data that we receive is not granular enough for us to be able to say this is investor X or Y who always at any given time. Um, because so many gilts, while they are in registered form, the vast majority are held in nominee accounts. Um, so it's very hard to find the ultimate beneficial owner. Um, but we do have a pretty good idea in general um, uh, of activities, you mentioned hedge funds, uh, but also overseas in official institutions, central banks, sovereign wealth funds. Um, and one you know, one of the interesting um, benefits last year of uh, syndicating a bond issue in, you know, in a maturity which we hadn't previously, 10, 15 years, was we saw a rather different order book to uh, some of the order books we'd seen previously, um, and a much greater preponderance, for instance, of official institutions. 
Uh, because sterling is, albeit on a modest scale, but it's, it is nonetheless and has remained throughout this period a reserve currency. You mentioned hedge funds. Yes, they were attracted to the market as well. And um, you know where there is market activity, where there is liquidity, where there is, and that is important, and where there is turnover, um, hedge funds uh, start to get very interested. And um, I thought it was quite notable that one of the measures we took to generate interest in our gilt auction operations last year was to increase what we call the post-auction option facility, um, which allows successful bidders to take down uh, even more of the gilt at the, at the strike price um, on the day. And that element of optionality is something that appeals to the hedge fund community. And I, I, I imagine, and I know that I think that was one, one of the reasons why we've seen um, further increase by the hedge fund community. And I, and I say that also to suggest that participation by hedge funds and indeed by any investors, the more participation from our perspective, the better it is for market diversity and market depth. Okay. Um, we have seen this year some vast order books for sovereign deals in particular. Um, but books that perhaps have been, I don't know whether the word is, whether the right word is unstable, i.e. very large at one point and then the pricing moves and they come tumbling back in. Um, I'm wondering how you have managed order book inflation. Is there a skill to it or do you just let your book runners get on with it? Yeah, it's a very tricky issue. And it's one that a lot of people have been commenting on um, and you know, quite correctly um, here in the UK, it sort of even um, caught the attention of our Treasury Select Committee. Um, the one thing which we've tried to convey to them, and we, I would try and convey now to anyone, is a statement of the obvious, and that is that the size of an order book on a syndication um, is not in any way representative of what I would call final end investor demand. And it is extremely important to understand that the dynamics of the market and the way the market works, and the way syndications and debt capital markets work are such that um, an investor who is keen to purchase a bond at a certain price will, in order to secure a better allocation, just put in a very large order, um, way in excess of what he or she actually needs on the day, way in excess. So the first thing I say is take the size of the order book with you know, a large chunk of salt, not just a pinch. Um, the second thing which I would say is that, um, and I hope that, the, you know, I, I don't want to sound uh, in any way um, arrogant here, but one thing which I'm, you know, I'm really proud that the team does here at the DMO, and people will know who I'm speaking about, is that they know the gilt market inside out. They also know, we know when we go into, when we go into a syndication, we know within usually I would say not just one basis point, but within half a basis point where we think that particular transaction should price. Yeah. And that is really important because you refer to the experience, I think, of others. And if you have a very wide pricing range, the likelihood of volatility in the book building process, in the order book, increases massively. Mm. So yes, while we've had very large order books, we have not at least had volatility in the order book. And that's an important distinction to make. Um, but in order to be able to do that, you need to know your market exceptionally well. Um, and I hope I just say, I, I hope it's not arrogant, but you know, when we go into a transaction and we're talking to our leads, we ask them to manage the order book. They have to manage the entire allocation process themselves directly with their customers. 
but we are pretty clear in our own mind where this thing should price. Yeah, that pricing judgment, though, will perhaps become a little harder when there is more, well, maybe volatility, but certainly in a rising yield environment uh, where it is harder to, to call the price, surely. I mean, that, that's something that perhaps is easier now than perhaps it will be in, let's say, 12 or 15 months' time. Possibly, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to suggest that this is just a very easy thing to do. Possibly. No. Possibly. But at the same time, you know, again, one of the benefits of having a really deep and liquid market is that even if the price has to adjust, mm. um, we know how it needs to adjust. And so does the rest of the market. We, this, is no, this is not a particular um, you know, sort of wisdom on our part. We can see in the course of, a, of building an order book, for instance, if the market starts to sell off, we will see what, you know, we, we will be able to, to see that, that the price ultimately may need to be adjusted. Um, but uh, the, notwithstanding that, the narrow range of an indicative pricing spread to another benchmark, maintaining that narrow range is unbelievably important. Yeah. Um, and that is the one way you can try and manage that volatility. Yeah. You mentioned uh, your Brookmaners just now. Um, you know, how, how do you expect your your group of gems to evolve? Um, are they are they becoming a bit of an endangered species? Um, I hope not. Uh, and I say that because the primary dealer model, which is one we've had for for a fair bit of time now, um, uh, in the UK effectively primary dealers or gems, whatever you like to call them. We've had them in place since 1986. But the, um, the, number, the number and the makeup is an, evolve, is an evolving thing, though. It is, but we've seen very little change in the last three or four years. I mean, I'm just trying to think when the last, the most recent change, I think, was in May 2018, okay. if I'm correct, um, when we saw... Um, one bank, Scotia, uh, decide to, to, um, to leave the market. Before that, it was 2015, 2016. Um, it's been very, very stable. Um, I don't, I've never had a prior as to what the, what the right number is of primary dealers, how many we, we should be having. It's an interesting question. Um, uh, You'd probably want more than five, though. But you, I think you might want to have more than five. And that, uh, but you, you know, you, what I think you, you're pointing to something which is, I think, quite quite important, which is that um, market making for a primary dealer in a deep liquid government bond market such as gilts is probably not a massive money spinner. It isn't a, money, a massive money spinner. However, participation in that market is essential for the banking industry. If, if a bank wants to be serious in global fixed income, it cannot and should not avoid the gilt market. Um, and um, there are other transactional flows associated with being present in that benchmark market that banks are very keen in being involved mm -hmm. in an ancillary business. Um, uh, so I would like to think that the bank, you know, bank management, gem management, primary dealer management are you know, capable of actually saying, with a particular franchise, with the gilt franchise, you don't, you shouldn't just look at it through the narrow prism of the regular auction bidding activity, but through the much wider franchise that is enhanced as a result of, of the business. Um, but I say that, I mean, it is incredibly competitive and, and sometimes too competitive. And I've always felt that the most important thing is that primary dealers are incentivized through good commercial self-interest to participate. That for us is the greatest guarantor that this whole system stays, you know, stays upright. Okay. Um, now, um, how do you expect the arrival of the EU, the European Union, as a major borrower to impact um, public sector bond markets. There, there is suggestion in some circles that the EU, you know, the bonds could become 
a new common asset in Europe. Um, how do you expect that to change the markets in which you operate, or, or is it you 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 sort of find shelter within within sterling? And, and therefore, I, I mean, I mean, to some extent, you answered part of the question when you say we find shelter in sterling. I mean, I, I don't know whether there will be a direct, there may be an indirect impact, but a direct impact on our market, I consider slightly unlikely, um, uh, certainly in the short term. However, um, I, first of all, I think actually it's a good thing. Um, I've always believed in the concept of diversification, um, of having, uh, you know, as many Capital markets, global capital markets, benefit from all sorts of business and variety, um, uh, and I think it's a great thing. But I want I perhaps just leave you with this thought: for it to have a really, really long-term impact, it's not just the size of what's been announced, however significant that is. And it's massive; it's absolutely massive. Um, and I think it will be significant. It's also the sustainability. The one thing that, that differentiates a sovereign debt manager, a pure sovereign debt manager from any other borrower, be it a supranational organization, the corporate, is that history has shown that debt management um, and is, 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 is something which is a permanent activity. Um, when the DMO was set up back in 1998, I think there was a cartoon in the FT, which had two people walking past a building, said DMO, and one, the, one said to the other, DMO, debt management must be a job for life. Um, uh, and, the, you know, the gilt market has itself has got a history which goes back uh, into the 17th century. Um, now, I don't know what's going to happen uh, you know, with the EU, um, and I mean that quite seriously in the sense of what their borrowing plans are, future borrowing plans are. What I would say is that sovereign debt markets actually suffer when supply is overly constrained. I'm not, that's not, I'm not trying to advocate fiscal incontinence. I'm just <laughs> saying that there needs to be a certain minimum of supply. Judging by what the EU has announced, they're going to be able to achieve that, certainly in the short term. The longer term, uh, that's, the, that's going to be the really interesting question. Okay. Well, Robert, um, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure, as ever, uh, but also extremely interesting. So thank you very much for talking to me. Um, and let me also say thank you to uh, our audience for listening. Um, and just to let you know that please do uh, stay tuned. Uh, the next session will start shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you.